I'm going to start off with a film so you guys can get jazzed about what I'm about to talk about. So go ahead and play it. I'm going to talk about basically dead amphibians today, the amphibians that you're finding in the stomachs of animals. Um, and this is due to Hart gave the title of the talk, Indirect Effects of Introduced Trout on Native Amphibians uh, in Northern California. So next slide. Well, I can try it here. I'd first like to acknowledge my authors, Karen Pope and Hart Welsh. side. Got it. Okay, um, you guys are all aware of this. Uh, establishing a fishery has been occurring for uh, over 100 years across, or actually around the world in higher elevation areas that contain lakes. Um, you can see in the, in the past they do it similarly today, but they do use airplanes. Um, I don't need to beat this subject to death, and it's received a lot of attention and research in the past 20 years. Um, but what has received less attention is the indirect effects, and um, this is a great lead off of what Karen was just talking about in her talk, and the thing she's trying to get at, this, this complements that. So there is evidence that indirect effects are occurring when you stock these lakes with fish. You, um, I've seen lots of these guys up there hunting for fish, the osprey. We've seen otters at 7,000 feet in the Trinity Alps wilderness, uh, about 34 kilometers from a fish-bearing stream, Trinity River actually. And by analyzing that animal's scat, it contained 100% um, brook trout bones. So. It has changed the ecosystem in some way, and that's what we're looking looking to do. So the outline of this talk is to, um, first I'm going to um, talk about the organisms involved in this. Then um, I'm going to talk about the problem and I'll go into a little theory behind the problem. And uh, then I'll focus on a basin scale study, and that is a study that um, the area that I've been working in for the past three years uh, on Cascades Frog Movement Ecology. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the larger landscape, Northern California, which is a larger part of Karen Pope, Hart Welsh, his data set, um, where they did a, a massive effort. Um, actually, it started out with Danny Boyano uh, in 1999. They did a massive census effort across um, the entire North, Northern California and wilderness areas um, to see what the amphibian assemblages were and how that affected uh, and how the fish interacted with that. So, this thing's horrible. Okay. Um, here's an introduction just to the uh, amphibian assemblage in Northern California is, 
is pretty amazing. Like we have eight species in the higher elevation areas, and uh, that's pretty rare. Uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about, go through who of them all are here, but basically the main focus of this whole meeting, essentially from our group, has been the Cascades frog, and um, but all these guys are up there, and uh, in in the basin I'm working in, this guy's important, and this guy's really important, the Pacific tree frog. Um, we also have two species of garter snakes that exist throughout the area and um, in Northern California. On the left is Thamnophis sirtalis. That's the common garter snake and it's really widespread. It's the basically the most successful uh, reptile in North America. And then on your right we have uh, Thamnophis atratus, the Pacific aquatic garter snake, which is um, in Oregon and California and this snake is is thought to be primarily a stream obligate and uh, where it feeds on amphibians and fish uh, regularly. And in our area here, you see it uh, abundant in anadromous streams. But um, I guess I can, should tell you how this study came about. I was started working with these animals because I was doing radio telemetry on my frogs, and eight out of 50 animals got eaten by these snakes. So I got really interested in what they were all about. So. Uh, Killing me. <laughs> okay. Can somebody go back for me here? I guess I'm doing it. Okay, okay, okay. Now that you've seen my talk. <laughs> okay. Can you guys go back, please? Up there. Back, 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 back. Back one more, one more. Okay, this is basically the ecosystem up there. It's pretty simple. High elevation areas, they you know they have lots of winter snowpack. It's not as complex as a lower elevation area. So you have um, here's your your prey base on the on the right here, and you have a lot of birds coming in and eating tadpoles at certain times of the year. And uh, you have these two species of snakes, which I introduced, and you also have the um, the invertebrates eating frogs. This is a little metamorph frog here that he was eating. But um, probably the main predator, the top predator in these aquatic eco ecosystems without fish, are these snakes. Uh, next. So what happens when you introduce a non-native um, fish? Well, we know they prey on the invertebrates, and we know they prey on the amphibians. But we know this guy eats fish. Next. So we want to look at the interactions of, of that guy with the fish. And um, I put a question mark here because um, we do have another hypothesis. Was this snake ever here prior to fish? I Meaning they stalked these areas. It could have seeded these streams and the, the snakes might have, they possibly could have come up. I, I don't have any evidence for that today, but it's just a neat idea that we're thinking about. Next. So a few uh, definitions. Um, Basically, the interactions, what I'm talking about, is a form of apparent competition, which is when multiple um, native prey species are attacked by one or more shared native uh, enemy species. So it's when a snake, that, that's, the, that's when you have native species involved. This, hypo, this uh, definition was modified when you have abnormally, abnormally high predation on indigenous prey species by a predator population that's inflated by abundant exotic prey. Uh, meaning fish. So this is what we're really trying to look at and what's occurring here. Next. So looking at classic predator reg regulation, uh, next. You can see that as the amphibians increase and decrease over time, the snake population should reflect what that, what's occurring with the frogs. What happens when you put in fish? Next. Well, fish are a stable, non-native food source, possibly, that could get stocked regularly, so their, their abundances can remain high. Next. So that if the snakes are eating the fish, that could in, inflate their numbers and keep them at higher population levels where they aren't as affected by the, um, the, the frogs. Now you look over time, it, the decrease um, over time, is, and it, it goes on an extinction trajectory, basically. And next. And this is where the snakes can hit these frogs really hard, is when the snake you know, populations are high and the frogs are decreased down here. Next slide. So here's the, the little model that, that we're focusing on is that Atreides without fish 
we probably had smaller populations. When you bring in the fish, they increase in numbers, sustain numbers, and prey more on their food base. And amphibians, next. So the basin study objectives were to investigate fine scale interactions between predators and prey and to their respective spatial and population dynamics. Basically, I wanted to look at distribution of these animals, density of these animals, and the diet of snakes. And I'm only focusing on snakes today because of time, and we're just starting to look into this question. Next slide. So here's the basin. Clara Wheeler did her breeding talk on Cascadia, and she outlined the, the whole basin pretty much yesterday. Um, so it's pretty much the same area. Next. This is some shots of, of the area and, and the habitats that it occur within. Next slide. So our results primarily in, from 2003 and 2005, we did 32 census periods. Back Every two weeks we surveyed for amphibians and snakes. And um, we, it ended up being over 400 surveys at 17 habitat patches. But we caught a lot of frogs, you can see. And then we caught um, a lot of snakes also. They're, and we marked snakes starting in 2004 with pit tags and scale clipping. And we had 58 um, Thamnophis tratus marked and 67 Sertalis marked. Um, those are individual animals. And uh, we did fish surveys also in 2005 doing snorkel surveys where we counted 348 in um, approximately 600 meters of stream. Next slide. Next slide. The so looking at the distribution and density of these snakes, um, I wanted to look at three different scales within the basin. First scale would be hydrological unit, and that is, was it in a pond or was it in a stream? Uh, next, the next is this zone scale. We have 74 zones in this basin, which are basically 50-meter belts along a habitat. Um, these are long meadow systems, and that's, each one represents a 50-meter belt. And then, next slide. And then we have um, the patch scale of, of what occurred. Okay, next slide. So these are some results of um, the proportion of snake captures in areas containing fish across these three spatial scales. So at the hydrological unit, you can see that um, Thamnophis atratus preferred to, to hang out in streams, whereas Sertalis, only five of them were seen in a stream pretty much. Um, well, maybe a little less, than, a little more than that. But um, this occurred across the landscape, or across all scales, that Sertalis were pretty much um, really no, low numbers in those areas um, in places with fish, whereas the trade is really capitalized in those areas. Next. Um, looking at the opposite, the, looking at uh, the percent of snake captures where tadpoles were found, um, you can see that Sertalis were really hanging out in areas that had lots of tadpoles um, at the hydrological unit and at the zone scale, but we didn't have any significant difference at the patch scale, and I would I would assume that there's no difference because amphibians pretty much breed throughout the landscape in that system, so it's not really operating at that level. Next slide. Here is um, some kernel estimators for each species of snake within the basin. These are 95% kernel estimates of the area utilized by these animals. So this is all the captures for each species thrown into one kernel to see what their distribution is. And Sertalis ended up being 19 times greater than, than a tradis. And look at these sample sizes. They're, they're relatively close, 140 Sertalis and 116 Atratus. Um, but Sertalis, has, its range was 19 times larger. And this light blue, blue line represents the fish, um, where the fish exist in this basin. Next slide. So diet, um, diet's probably the most important thing to, within this basin study that we found. And um, we, palp we palpated 109 snakes, Sertalis, with 38 of these that had food in their stomachs. And then we 99 Atratus and also 38 um, prey items in their stomachs. Well, 38 individuals had prey items in their stomachs. Next slide. So the proportion of prey group by snakes, Atratus are eating fish, and they're eating them more than amphibians. Approximately 56% of Atratus had fish in their stomachs, um, whereas Sertalis, amphibian specialists. So they don't prey switch pretty much from these data um, like, like a trade is due. Next slide. Breaking down, uh, this is Sertalis prey type by the total length of the snake. You can see that they, they're not picky on the size of the animal 
the size of the snake, they don't really care what they're eating. They'll eat larval amphibians being very large. And this is a gape limitation, I think, for um, adult amphibians. Smaller snakes can't eat those. But when you look at Atreides, next slide. Next slide, thanks. Um, just below the blue line, you can see that smaller snakes are really keen into these amphibians. Um, but the larger snakes are really choosing, you go above the line now, they're really choosing fish. But all sizes, classes of these snakes are eating fish. Next slide. So conclusions for the basin study is that uh, Atreides eat fish regularly um, and more, and amphibians regularly, but they eat fish more. Um, both snake species regularly occupy different niches in the basin. Um, Atreides is narrowly distributed and has extremely higher densities in Sertalis in areas with fish. Um, and hyperpredation may be occurring in, um, on amphibians in areas with fish, but this is still a big question because, um, which I will answer later after I talk about the landscape level. Next slide. So here is the landscape level. All the areas in red indicate the wilderness areas that um, Hart's team uh, surveyed. And um, next. Uh, across Northern California, and these are two different scales. These are the same um, chi-square statistics that I showed in um, at the basin scale, showing proportion of snake sites containing fish. So areas where you caught the snakes, what are the, how many of them had fish? And you can see that um, Atreides were existing in much larger numbers in places that had fish than without, whereas Sertalis in less, and they occurred in a more broad landscape, than, and they weren't more connected to the to the fish component. So next, and this also occurred in the Trinity Alps, so you have entire Northern California and Trinity Alps wilderness at a smaller landscape scale. This is approximately 500,000 acre wilderness. Uh, next. So um, Karen did some um, generalized additive models to look at what is driving these species of where they exist. You know, is it fish, is it amphibians? So. Um, after controlling for, um, for variables such as um, latitude and long longitude, spatial variables and habitat variables, um, elevation and uh, size of the uh, habitat, um, tested the models, including trout and amphibians. And you can see for Atreides, it was signi highly significant that they predicted, that fish predicted the presence of these animals. It was also significant an interaction variable between trout and amphibians. But amphibians alone for um, Atreides was not significant. They were not, they did not um, predict the presence of, of Atreides. Next slide. Opposite uh, occurred for Sertalis, which um, both, uh, uh, you can see that trout was not a, a predictor for the presence of, uh, of Sertalis, but amphibians was a significant predictor for these amphibians, with, with amphibians, so. Next slide. Um, so is there ecological consequences? Um, at the basin scale, it's, it's at the, where I was working, there's a lot of amphibians. We caught over 5,000 Cascades frogs. There's lots of food for these animals to eat. And uh, next slide. And frogs move a lot. This is some movement data from my study. I show this every year because it, it just tells, it's a thousand words there. But anyways, this could be a double-edged sword in, with what's going on here in that you have a place where fish are isolated and the snakes are really high densities, but frogs move so much, they're, they're around the basin, and, and this one little spot could affect the whole basin by um, these frogs' be general movement behavior. But on the other side of it, the frogs move a lot so they can avoid these areas that have high pressure. Next slide. So there, in Karen's study, there, she has a lake system that's, that's different in that there's less habitat, it's only one isolated lake and a small pond a couple small ponds. She had horribly low, low numbers of Cascades frogs there, 0.64 captures per survey, I guess on average, but she had 0.47 captures of Atreides, the snake there, and um, the, these frogs don't have many places to hide because they can go over, the snakes can move around, the fish can't, but the snakes can, and they can prey switch anytime they want, as my data show with the diet. Next slide. I'd like to thank um, all my field help, and Karen thanked hers in her talk. Um, this study could not have been done without the help of Fish and Game, especially Betsy Bolster. She was instrumental in getting funding, looking at these indirect effects. Um, so they are funding 
funding research that looks at not just the direct effects of fish stocking, and they're taking it to another level, and I really appreciate that. We also got funding from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, U.S. Forest Service, and most importantly today, I got a seed grant from Declining Amphibians Population Task Force, jointed with Army. Um, thank you. <laughs>